Let's get started on this lesson about communication. In this lesson, we'll look at why we communicate. And to do that, we're going to examine the nature of communication. Really, what is that behavior? And then we'll look at next how we communicate interpersonally. And then finally, we'll wrap this lesson up looking at some skills to help us build our communication competence. Humans are inherently social beings that when we're denied the opportunity for interpersonal interaction, it can have a dramatic effect on our mental and our physical health. Uh, that's a real big reason why things like solitary confinement in the U.S. is considered to be such a harsh punishment. Several studies that are referenced in our text uh, show that when people are out or cut off from others for an extended period of time, their physical health can also quickly deteriorate. So let's look at some of our additional needs that we have for communication. A second one here would be the relational needs. Other than our physical needs, we have several relational needs, such as needs for companionship and affection, relaxation and, and escape. We don't necessarily have the same needs in all of our relationships. You, you know, you probably value your friends for somewhat different reasons than you value your coworkers, for example. But the bottom line is, though, that we need these relationships and communication is part of that how we build and keep those relationships. Next is the identity needs. The way we communicate with others and the way others communicate back with us plays a really big role in shaping how we see ourselves. You know, as you'll learn in some of the later, uh, later lessons and chapters and such, people form their identities in part by comparing themselves with others. Now, if you consider yourself intelligent, for example, uh, what that really means is that you see yourself as more intelligent than most other people. Now, if you think you're shy, you see most other people as more outgoing than you are. So we kind of use those communication channels to help us form our uh, sense of identity as well. Spirituality, uh, spiritual needs. Spiritual needs includes the principles valued in life. You know, I value loyalty or I value equal treatment for all the people. It also encompasses people's morals, people's values, their notions of right and wrong, like it's never okay to steal. Uh, finally, spirituality in communication involves people's beliefs about the, about the meaning of life, which often includes personal philosophies of nature and so forth. Instrumental needs. Uh, researchers that we've referencing uh, in our in our text as well uh, refer to these needs as instrumental needs. Or instrumental needs include things like accomplishing a short-term task, ordering drinks at a restaurant, completing a task at work, and they also include longer-term goals such as a career goal, getting a better job getting that promotion and getting one's work noticed uh, appropriately. Uh, because it serves a need that helps us get through our personal and professional lives, we also spend a lot of time thinking about communication as an instrumental, uh, as a tool to help us accomplish our instrumental needs. Next, scholars really, and our textbook talks about this a lot, uh, use three models to demonstrate how the process of communication works. So next we're going to look at what that ecosystem or what that environment of communication uh, really, really looks like. Uh, first is an action model. We'll look at an interaction model and then we'll look at a transactional model uh, at the end as well. In the, the first one here is the action model. In the action model, we think of communication as a, as a I call it a hypodermic needle. It's a one-way process. So let's say you want to leave work early one day to attend a parent-teacher conference at your, at your daughter's school, and you're getting ready to ask your supervisor for, for hey, approval. I'm going to take off a couple hours early. Uh, as illustrated in this image on the bottom, uh, the action model starts with a source. You, you come up with uh, a thought or an idea you wish to, to send or communicate. In the action model a, of communication, a sender is encoding that message in their brain and uh, convey it through a communication channel for a receiver to decode. In this example, the message might be might be the question like, would it be cool if, if I left a little early today? Now, according to this action model, you then uh, send your message through a channel. Okay, that channel could be verbally spoken. It could be sent via via chat, via text, via email. Uh, it's it, Regardless of how it's done, it's a pathway. Uh, you might pose your question to your person, supervisor face-to-face. -face. You might send it to them. Next step is the supervisor acts as the receiver or the person that you're sending the message to acts as the receiver and they deconstruct or they decode the message. Uh, they're the person who are who is interpreting that message. 
And during this process, there is little also likely to be uh, some noise that's going on, which is anything, anything internal, external that interferes with a receiver's ability to attend your message. So that's really the, the action model. Very simple, one way. Think about it like a transaction. It's a one way transaction. You're sending it to a receiver through a channel. Uh, the message has been encoded and then it's decoded. Very simple, very basic too. Uh, let, next, let's, let's elevate our conversation here and look at this interaction model. Uh, it takes up, takes up where the action model leaves off. It includes all the same elements, okay? Source, encoder, message, channel, receiver, decoder. It includes all those same elements, uh, noise and so forth, and coding and decoding. However, it differs in, in two ways. First, it recognizes that communication is a two-way, not a transactional process, but a two-way uh, ongoing uh, exchange. And then this model also explains that our messages are shaped by the feedback that we receive from others and by the context in which we are interacting or the context in which we are sending the message. So here we see that the speakers are paying attention to their, their friend's feedback or their colleague's feedback and communicating in a way that is appropriate uh, for, for that exchange. And then finally, uh, the transactional model or the transaction model. Uh, unlike the action and interaction model, this the transaction model of communication illustrated here doesn't distinguish between the role of sender and receiver. Instead, both parties uh, maintains both parties main, are maintained in the conversation. They're simultaneously sources of the uh, they're simultaneously the source of the message, and they're simultaneously receiving the message. So they're playing both both roles. Uh, in addition, it argues that the conversation flows in both directions at the same time, and this transaction model recognizes that both people in a conversation are simultaneously senders as well as receivers. Now, some situations are, ch in our, our, some communication channels are communication-rich contexts, meaning they involve many different communication channels at once, not just one simple channel. In face-to-face -face conversation, for example, uh, you can pay attention uh, to your partner's words. You can see their expression and your gestures. You can hear the tone of the voice and so on. Uh, then when you move online, maybe emails, you can see the words. You might be able to see some uh, see some. Uh, Emotion, emoticons, if you will, or some emojis in your messaging. But for the most part, when then when you move online, then you're really just looking at the language uh, or the words being used. So there's a big difference in how rich those two types of of communication are. So a couple a couple communication characteristics when we look at it. Rely the the quality of the communication relies on the channels. Anything you put through a filter, uh, anything you put through a filter, such as air, water, light, anything, it's going to come out different on the other side, different than, when, than how it went into the, went, uh, started through going through the filter. The same thing happens when we communicate. What one person says is not always exactly what the other person hears either. We all filter uh, incoming communication through our perceptions or perceptual filters, through our experiences, through our biases, through our prejudices, through our beliefs, through our stereotypes, and so forth. Uh, Another communication characteristic is that is that the meaning when we that of what we write and we and we speak, the meaning is chosen by our words and we choose our words deliberately so we can say what we mean or at least try to say what we mean. Where does that meaning come from? That's that's the real question here. By itself, a word really has no meaning. It's just a sound or a set of uh, a set of marks on a piece of paper or a monitor. A word is only a symbol to which we have ascribed a certain meaning. Another communication characteristic is that it has literal meanings as well as relational implications. Nearly every verbal statement has a content dimension, which means the literal information being conveyed. Uh, and it also has a relational dimension as well, in the sense that it's impacting or changing or modifying the relationship you might have with someone. Also, much of what we communicate uh, to others is deliberate. When you set up a... Uh, set up a job interview, for example, you do so intentionally, having thought about whether you want the job, whether you'd be a good candidate or a good fit for that. Very rarely do you schedule anything by accident. Uh, you might, however, communicate a number of other things without any meaning. For example, you might have, uh, have you ever tried to stay awake in an important meeting? Uh, you're communicating things intentionally as well as intentionally uh, uh, at the same time. Uh, communication is finally governed by rules. 
Rules tell us what behaviors are required, the preferred or prohibited, and various social contexts. Some rules are communicate. Uh, some rules for communication are explicit rules, saying we've stated this out loud, and then other rules are more implied or uh, implied or implicit uh, to the actual context or to the actual environment in which the communication is taking place. Now, people communicate. We've talked about some of the characteristics. But the ancillary would be, what are some of the myths associated with communication? So people communicate constantly. So it's easy to believe that just everyone, in, uh, everyone is an expert in it. Uh, we do it all the time, so we must be really good at it. In, in, instead, there are some myths here we want to we scroll through to kind of highlight what some of the misconceptions are about communication. First, everyone is an expert. Not, not, th not true. It's important to remember, though, that just having experience with something is not the same as having expertise in it. Another myth, communication will solve any problem. We just need more communication. Uh, it's, it's easy to blame a lack of communication when things go wrong. The fact is, however, that poor communication isn't always the cause of everything and that uh, fixing those communication problems is not going to uh, fix everything else as well. Next, communication, communication can break down. Just as we sometimes blame our problems or a lack of communication, uh, on, on uh, just as we blame these things as the root of all other problems, for instance, when a married couple might divorce, the spouse may say it was a, a breakdown in communication that led to their relationship difficulties. It may be easy to blame this breakdown in communication for problems we face in personal relationships, but here's the key. Instead of saying communication is, is broken down, uh, what's really happening in these situations is that we are no longer communicating effectively. That's the key there. Uh, it's not necessarily broken down. It's not, it has become ineffective. In other words, the problem lies not with the communication itself, but the way you are using it. Next, another myth, thinking about uh, communication as inherently good. Uh, thinking that communication is inherently good is similar to thinking that money is inherently good uh, or that it's inherently evil. Sometimes money can be put to a positive use or a negative use, just as providing uh, communication or communication can be good to put to a positive use or to a, a negative use as well. And then finally, uh, the next myth or the last myth, come on, is that when people have genuine disagreements, uh, communication is always better. That's that's another myth that we want to kind of uh, tackle at this point. More talk, uh, more communication doesn't always help. In some cases, increasing communication can just lead to to more problems, uh, more frustration, and more anger. So let me uh, build, give you a, a standard definition of what it means to communicate uh, interpersonally. So interpersonal communication consists of communication that occurs between obviously two people uh, within the context of their relationship and that as it evolves helps them to sometimes highly intimate as well as romantic partners discussing the details of a sensitive health issue possibly that one of them is experiencing so this relationship progresses possibly to uh, to negotiate and define a more intimate level of relationships. Now, the content of another interpersonal conversation falls somewhere along the continuum between intimate and mundane topics. Each of these conversations is still interpersonal. However, to be uh, to the extent that which uh, it helps two people negotiate and define the relationships. So, they, so think about it like that. That interpersonal communication really helps you define your relationship. Now, how do you become better uh, in building and enhancing some of those competencies? Most all scholars seem to agree that competence means that you are communicating in a way that is both effective and appropriate in a given situation. That's what we mean, we mean by competence. Uh, effectiveness describes how well your communication achieves its goals. And then appropriateness, being appropriate, a competent communicator should also be appropriate, and that means attending to the rules and expectations that apply in a given situation. So competence comes down to two things. How effective you are, uh, uh, how well your communication achieves its goals is the effective part, and the appropriate part is is uh, attending the ability or the skills to which you attend to the rules and expectations that apply in a social, uh, any, any given situation. Now, good communications, or good communicators, rather, are aware of their own behavior as it affects others. Uh, research calls this, uh, uh, this self-awareness, they call this self-monitoring, like you're monitoring yourself. It's one thing to be aware of your own behavior. It's quite another to be able to adapt it to, to different situations. Competent communicators are able to assess 
what is going on, and then modify or change their given behavior in, a, in, a, in, a situ, in each situation. Good communication practices uh, practices empathy as well. The ability to be other-oriented and understand other people's thoughts and feelings. A competent communicator is, also has the ability to consider a variety of explanations and to understand a given situation in multiple ways. This is that cognitive complexity. How well can you... There we go. There's cognitive complexity. How well can you handle and modify, uh, modify your message based on the complexity of the cognitive actions? And then finally, a competent communicator uh, is also, also ethical. Now, when you think about it online, let's, that, that was a good kind of a, a good primer on, on what it means in, in face-to-face everyday communication. But then when you translate that to online, uh, online or competent online communication also observes a few other practices. Being aware of the potential for misunderstanding, presuming that everything is permanent and nothing is secret. That's obviously not the truth. And then avoiding communicating, and then always avoiding uh, communication and anger. And I think of, I think of all the emails that I have written over the years, uh, not necessarily to students per se, but to uh, to to colleagues at work, to coworkers, when I'm really really uh, frustrated or, or or yeah, frustrated is a good word for it. Frustrated about something at work. How many times I've written an email. And fortunately, not sent it. Uh, I've either deleted it or uh, saved it and said, I'm going to come back and look at this later. Come back and look at it and say, man, I'm glad I didn't send that. Uh, so always, that's a good good tip here. Always uh, go ahead and write that email. Just don't send it. 